the partisan monument in Mostar is the work of the great Yugoslav and Serbian architect Bogdan Bogdanovic. Bogdanovic was a completely unusual architect, who was actually more of a thinker and philosopher of architecture than a classical craftsman or contractor. Educated in the surrealist circle of his family, he never ceased to amaze with his bold combinations of imagination, surrealism and architecture. Although highly educated and guided by a constant gift of reference, this is an architect who likes to wander, to discover by walking and breathing, to constantly discover in his imagination the connections between space and form. From his schooling, although he did not build much, he was guided and developed principles, as he himself called them, invisible architecture. In his architectural imagination, he created invisible model cities in Montenegrin forests, chimneys of the underground city in Vukovar, lonely hematops in Pazin and Bihać, sold flowers of good and life in Jasenovac, a house for griffins in Čačak, a floating theater city in Mostar. City's ideas sold monuments in Travnik, Kosovska Mitrovica, Prilep, Plasotince, Leskovac, Knjaževac, Čačak, Bela Crkva, Štip, Ivangrad, Vrnjačka Banja, Aranđelovac, Sremska Mitrovica, Klis and Belgrade. In his architectural gnosis and philosophy of urbanism, he combined Pythagoreanism, Neoplatonism, Renaissance and Baroque with Surrealism and Modernism, a world of ideas with idealism and the realization of matter. Instead of working on concrete buildings, he opted for the world of monuments and landscape architecture because it allowed him to preserve his lush imagination and to hide his connections between profane demands and eternal pagan dynamics. The recording of small urbanism, all that is minimalist and oniric, which turned an ordinary building into more hidden conversations, served as a continuous source in a public space. Combining and finding the mythological in the urban. His way of thinking, wrote in drawings and numerous books, which can perhaps most simply be called urban mythologema. His life and career moved from invisible architecture through a futile travel until, at the end of his life, after the demolition of his many monuments, a doomed Neymar. The partisan monument in Mostar was created after the difficult and exhausting construction of the monument in Jasenovac. Mostar and Bogdanovich have long recognized each other. The very idea of the monument was proposed by Jemal Biedic, a well-known Mostar and Yugoslav politician. The monument was conceived as a place of remembrance for the fallen members of the Mostar battalion especially those who fell in the battles of Neretva and Sutjeska. As it was about Bogdanovic's comrades in arms, from the very beginning he experienced this monument more personally. As he would later say, he decided to make a monument to the ideal, a monument to the idea that mostly very young people went to fight for, believing that the dead boys and girls deserve the place for the dignified beauty of dreams. That is why this monument has no clearly visible ideological features. He was looking for something personal that characterizes the partisan Yugoslav movement, and he experienced and felt the flame as its symbol, and not the five-pointed star because it is common to many peoples. There is no visible symbol of flame on the monument, but there are places 
that are secretly associated with it. Construction of the monument began in 59, and it was built six years to be opened in 65. It was built with a very unusual artistic symbolism, almost adventurous enthusiasm, and how it will turn out later, a unique community of most are men and women who did not need any directive to directly and indirectly be by their monument. Bogdanovich himself did not leave too many instructions on how the monument should be read, partly because he liked to keep his secrets to himself, but also because he knew that it ignited the imagination of those who will find their place in thinking about the meaning of the monument. Nevertheless, there are enough oral and written testimonies left in the form of individual texts, some interviews, as well as stories from the author's posthumous exhibitions. In those years, the other, new side of Mostar, was still waiting for its real momentum. For centuries, Mostar has been a river city, a city that follows the course of the Neretva River. But socialist modernism is beginning to create a new city. By the way, Mostar is now clearly visible, a city that is constantly being assembled and disassembled. At the beginning of World War II, the city had a population of 18,000 and at the end there will be 11,000. Forty-five years later, at the beginning of the new war of the 90s, the city has 120,000 inhabitants. Mostar started to develop in the direction of its suburbs, where the coal mine dominated, and one such monument was a good landmark, a sign of the direction in which the city is developing. Bogdanovich was enchanted and moved by the construction skills of the Mimar Hairudin and his old bridge. Therefore, he directed the geometric monument so that there is an invisible line that connects them directly and numerically. Neymar conceived his projects as drawings, with directions understandable only to him, which he then translated into specific instructions in parts for the needs of the professionals, never revealing his secret ideas. The monument is entered through a small gate, which is immediately decorated with ancient capitals. Two smaller roads begin a slight ascent to the top, while in front of you is a small canyon that symbolizes the extensions of the Noretva riverbed that flows between the two cities. Generations of visitors in this place have suggestively seen the canyons of the Neretva and Sutisko rivers, where the fallen fighters buried in this place were killed. Once upon a time, light water flowed along the bottom of these silent organ pipes, putting it in the place of a fountain. To its left is an object known as a lake, another static fountain. After the war and numerous devastations of the place, the water no longer appeared and now it is clear it is the bridge that connects two cities, which was supposed to connect them permanently, the city of the living and the city of the dead. It is he who conveys the visible geometric line that connects the old bridge, the old town, with this place. In this way, Neymar Bogdanovich wanted the memory of the fighters for the city to never be neglected. He also did not want the place to become only a place of lamentation and admonition, but a place of learning and development. Inspiration for architectural imagination were the Sumerian hanging floating cities of the ziggurats, but also Roman military cemeteries and numerous mythological and proto-pagan symbols. And, indeed, as we climb, the feeling of hovering increases. 
We pass by the small squares of the city, and under our feet are 26,000 pebbles taken from the Narrator River. On the side of the wall, there are stone slabs removed from the former older Herzegovinian houses, which the citizens of Mostar, on their own initiative, brought and donated to the builders. The main builder incorporated this enthusiasm into the future monument, a monument that will not have clear state symbols, but will have a paraphrase of the Minoan horns that mark the place, marking it sacred. It will have the heroic paraphrase of Roman cemetery without features, with the piece of the Elysium for fallen heroes. On the second terrace, the field of the tombstones is clearer. The story of the origin of their shape is very interesting. When people saw them, they immediately called them flowers, and they remain known as flowers. But in essence, they are a symbol of cut tree that very clearly symbolizes a suddenly interrupted young life. But there is also an unusual parallelism of the idea, another hidden meaning. At the very beginning of the project, during the encounter with the hill on which the monument was to be erected, Neymar found a young forest. He had to cut down that forest, and because of that he was terribly sad. And all he could do was leave the memory of one into the interrupted life of the people and the interrupted life of the trees. On the last upper terrace, you can see the panorama, this time of the new Mostar. You can see its new variations. The new buildings that were built on the site of the one that burned down in the last war, and which have yet to pass the test of value of years. In the place of a city that has developed over the centuries, a city has suddenly emerged that it's still learning to love itself. And it cannot be said that it's going easily or successfully for it. In any case, the process is slow. Behind it, as the final and dominant symbol, is the symbol of the cosmos, eternity and source, the symbol of hope. It is only at this point that the meaning of the monument can be seen to move in two directions. From real life and the real city, one travels to eternity, the cosmos and vice versa. All mortal things arise from the cosmos, while the souls of the dead are at their rest. In this way, the memory of the sacrifice of people who did not live to see their city free and restored is ensured. The two cities are constantly looking each other in the eye and constantly taking care of each other. The terraces of the monument originally became just that, public space of piety, walking, reading, calming thoughts and starting love. Today it remains to tell us how the monument was declared a national monument. But it is still destroyed, neglected. But as long as it exists, there will be some hope, because its very existence testifies to the possibility of a high aesthetic and artistic quality of the city of Mostar. The construction of the monument was specific. After numerous rough works carried out through blasting and voluntary work actions in which the entire city participated, traditional stone artists, stone masons from the island of Korchula in Croatia, took the stage. No one better than Neymar himself can describe this process, so I will read his records of the monument here. The partisan necropolis was a miniature mostar a replica of the city on the Neretva banks, its ideal diagram. However, that ideogram of the city, that hieroglyph, that stone mark was not as modest in size. It reached the contours of the modest primeval Balkan Hellenic Acropolis. Between the entrance, the lower gate, and the fountain at the top, one had to ascend an elevation of about 20 meters and hike some 
300 meters of winding paths and hairpin turns. The road upwards was discernible by the water streaming down the stone organs towards the visitors. What do stonemasons who carve a city out of space and time look like? My Mostarian friends found them on the island of Korchula in Croatia and took everyone from the village who could hold a chisel or hammer. They were brought to Mostar at the end of the 50s or in the early 60s. They were modest, polite and friendly and they did their work religiously, almost liturgically. The resonance of their chorus, like liturgy of the chiseling, took a little interruption included five years. They were guided by Barba, which means uncle and grandfather in their dialect, a paternal head of the fellowship, a guardian. Once Barba arrived, he determined a location for the quarry, built a construction shed and made room for his working space, which resembled both a chair and a pulpit. He then ordered that the chest made of, out of poles, though without lid or bottom, be filled with sand a little pieces of stone, so that the piece of stone to be carved could light softly and would not be damaged during the works. Across from his working space, directly facing him, the workers put their somewhat smaller chests. Because of the heat in Herzegovina, they worked more often at night than during the day, from dawn until breakfast and from dusk till deep in the night. During the summer months, Mostar, that beautiful and now bygone city, and its citizens had a strong habit of waiting in the street for the coolness to emerge from the riverbed of the Neretva around midnight. Sometimes it seemed as if everybody, even children, had forgotten that one could also sleep at night. I adopted their habit, not just because I too needed the coolness to get sufficient sleep and a productive working rhythm for the following day, but also because I was playful, or rather nervous, and also even a little afraid. I had promised the inhabitants of Mosta to make something that would be unparalleled. I had driven them up the coasts, I initiated a lot of work, but was I, I even sure that I would succeed and finish everything the way I envisioned it? One night I decided to go up to the building site. From a distance I could hear a song, a harmony of voices, a choir without words. Step by step I came closer. I looked from the sidelines, from the darkness. Acetylene lamps, or maybe even lamps from the previous century. Caustic light and even more caustic shadows. In this light something mysterious occurred. Barba, grey, hair electrified dispersed to the four corners of the world, commits a crime like a magician, as the ghost of the stones. Suddenly, he lifts the hammer and the chisel up in the air. Everybody lifts their hammer up in the air. They irreverently keep silent. A silence takes hold of the place that reveals the voices of the night, crickets, whistling night birds, the distant sound of the Neretva. One of the masons, apparently appointed for this purpose, once again initiates a melody without words, nasal and mysterious, as in a ritual of stone worshippers. Barba picks up the rhythm with his chisel, hits the block in front of him, and starts to work the stone. The song clearly prescribes the pace and force of the hack. As soon as the melody starts to rise, everybody is singing now, the sound of the hacks get ear-splittingly loud. Once it sets again, the hits get less intense. Every stone sounded like a musical instrument. I knew, predictably, that different kinds of stone would resonate differently. The softer the stone, the deeper the tone. It is paradoxical, and also a bit comical, 
that the most solid granite whispers, that marble sings a metal soprano, and chalk, the most musical stone, sings a beautiful or velvet soft alto. Sculptors know how to perceive and even more. Every piece sings its own song, says one of them, in the conviction that every piece of stone is a being in itself. But when the collective hacking commences, the rhythm includes every stone instrument, and suddenly every hand movement, every body posture functions in such a way that the whole orchestra serves as its own metronome at the same time. And when the hits of tools begin to falter, a sign that the concentration is starting to drop, Barba, the specter of the stone, unsatisfied, holds up his hammer. It is a sign that the work will be momentarily halted and that the hacks have to be harmonized from the beginning. Everybody waits for the first voice and Barba's first hit. The fact that it was a harmony without words got me thinking that the ancient proto-historical version came from times that people on the island and on the mainland spoke another forgotten pre-Slavic language. Civilizations switched, languages melted, but men had stayed the same. Why doesn't the song have words? I once asked. The replies were simple and convincing. They're not there, they never were. Or, that's how our ancestors used to sing it as well. The monument slowly got built, laboriously and carefully, by voluntary contributions also in natura, in which case the natura was stone. Even stone of Mustarian houses, that were for the most part destroyed by time and urban planning, and families gladly donated their stone buildings. Even the quiet moving of the material, the material from the old town included, had a symbolic value. The stones, often with centuries old traces of smoke and calcified moss, with housekeepers, a plant species, transported pieces of memories and the spirit of piety from one time to another, and mixed it with mighty quantities, freshly mysoned stone, as white as cheese. On the highest terraces, at the inner stone walls of the city, in the folds of the stone walls, semicircular niches, apsides, buttresses, squandered themselves in hundreds and hundreds of stone flowers, at least partly because of belief in the ancient suspicion of the builder alchemist that the mason is the child of the sun and the moon, and that he therefore is so exceptionally suitable for, even destined to, the carving of heavenly phenomena, the stone flowers got abundantly mixed with the representation of the sun, the moon, planets, constellations. A place was found somewhere for the constellation of the great dog, which I had never been able to discern when I look at the skies, and even for a group of stars that doesn't even exist in the celestial carpet, but that I christened seven slender cows in my imagination. For those not familiar with the question, these were the Vlasic, referring to the mountain Vlasic in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Eventually, it turned out that the partisan necropolis as a whole recalled the grand astronomical model from which we all originate. The lilting, hidden character of partisan necropolis could not remain an artist. Its terraces were quickly seized by children whose playful voices echoed in a choir amid an almost scenographic stone landscape, sometimes until deep in the night. The only thing I could still wish for is generously offered, a bit a joke and a bit serious as well, the right to, as honorary citizen of Mostar, create a secret niche to the left of the entrance gate to accommodate my future urn. However, it now seems like I will not be in the company of my friends that way. 
The gravestones have cold-bloodedly and sadistically been taken away and crushed in a stone grinder. All that is left of my original promise is that the former city of the dead and the former city of the living still look at each other, only now with empty, black and burned eyes.